So as many of you know, I spent all of last week in San Antonio, where I attended a five-day academy for spiritual formation. And I have to tell you, it was a, in many ways a wonderful week. It was a much-needed time away for spiritual renewal. And even though it was in many ways restful, it was also a very full week. We started each day at 7.30 with morning prayer, followed by breakfast, and ended each day with evening prayer from 8.30 to 9 p.m. In between, we learned, we reflected both silently and as a group, and of course we worshiped some more. The learning part of the academy was taught by two amazing teachers. In the morning, we learned some about the teachings of the great Dutch Catholic priest, Henry Nouwen, from Dr. Will Hernandez, who is an expert on the writings of Nouwen. And in the afternoons, we were taught about the spirituality and the wisdom of the desert fathers and mothers of the 4th through 6th centuries. And this was taught by my friend and former professor, Dr. Roberta Bondi. And it's from what she taught each day that I would like to share with you this morning. And I have to tell you that it was one of those things that I've heard a lot of what she taught before, and each time it just so fills me with inspiration that I want to go out and share it with somebody else. So in midweek, I'm texting John and Colin and saying, oops, toss the sermon title and the scripture for Sunday. I'm doing something else. So today's sermon is kind of a reflection on what I learned this week. I'm not sure I can fully do it justice, but it was so uplifting and inspiring to me, I wanted to try to share some of that with you this morning. Our friend Roberta, my teacher, my mentor, has a great love for the teachings of the Abbas and Amas, the fathers and mothers of the early monastic movement. These monks, who were mostly male, but also some female, lived primarily in the desert of Egypt and the surrounding areas. Now, some of them did lead a very solitary life, but for the most part, they, leave, they lived in small communis, communities or monasteries that often consisted of small individual huts, or they called them cells, and were organized around a particular Abba or teacher. Theirs was a subsistence level existence. Their days consisted primarily of prayer, and what they mostly prayed were the 150 psalms we find in our Old Testament. But their prayer alternated with some work, such as weaving baskets or mats or, or gardening, tending the garden there in their monastery. Their goal was to make just enough money to live on with a little left over for those in need. So when they would go to bed at night, they would leave some coins outside their huts, and if somebody who was in need came by, they could come and take those coins. So they were, even though they lived very simply, they always had something to share with others. They were vegetarians because they believed that Adam and Eve before the fall were vegetarians, and their diet was very simple and pretty much the same from day to day and very bland. And part of the reason for that was they didn't want anything to distract them from their devotion and connection with God in prayer. So theirs was a simple life with a simple yet oddly complex goal. Their goal was to grow in one's love of God and neighbor. For them, the goal of the Christian life was found in that one great commandment that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. And with the help of their teachers, the Abbas and the Amas, they lived in a life that was truly dedicated to prayer. And also the work of God through the Holy Spirit, they sought to live out that one great commandment in everything they did. And interestingly enough, 
even though they believe that all Christians share a common goal, this love of God and neighbor, and in many ways a common way of life, unlike us moderns, they didn't believe that there was only one single right route everyone must follow to accomplish that goal. They were very good at recognizing that people are different from each other and that what keeps me from being able to fully love God and neighbor is probably very different from what hinders you. So in other words, they highly valued and understood the diversity of human life, of human beings. Of course, even though they believe that loving is something natural that we are created with, they believe it is also unnatural. I mean, they believe and it was unnatural not to love. They also believe that most of us either fail to love properly or that we do it very badly, not because we're somehow bad people, but because our lives are so often dominated by fear. Remember that passage from John talked about fear? You know, for most of us, there's a fear of dying, there's a fear of being vulnerable, um, there's a fear of being hurt, we fear not being good enough, we fear not being loved by others. And so we end up spending a lot of our time compensating for those fears. As Roberta puts in her book, To Love As God Loves, because of this fear that we have, we end up needing power over people. We end up afraid of the future. And we suffer from things like envy and resentments and depression and hyperactivity and boredom. And she continues by saying that our fourth century ancestors thought that none of that was necessary. As God has come to us and still comes to us in Jesus to help overcome our fears. Perfect love cast out fear, First John says. God has come to us in Christ to break the hold our destructive ways of being have over us and to restore our wounded and distorted humanness if only we'll let it and if we're willing to seek it out. This, she says, was the very purpose of the incarnation. In the incarnation, we are shown the way back to that original image of God in which we were created, and we are enabled to become really loving and thus truly human. And this was the inspiration of the moment that became monasticism. <laughs> so what we find here in the teachings of these early monks is an emphasis on sin as a distortion of the image of God within us. Somehow that image of God in which we were all created has become distorted in us. But rather than seeing it as a litany of things we do wrong or we don't do right, they see that very differently. They see that distortion as kind of a film over the lenses through which we view life, and then that makes us do things we might call sin. It's very different. Most of these were a part of what became the Eastern branch of Christianity, what we would know now as the Greek Orthodox, the Ru Russian Orthodox, the uh, Coptic or Egyptian Orthodox. We come out of that branch of the church that was the Western church when they split, starting with the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Reformation and on down. And the Western branch of Christianity see things very differently than the Eastern branch. The Western church has come to talk about sin as this list of do's and don'ts and what you believe and what you don't believe. And if you don't believe the right things, then you're a sinner. If you do this, you're a sinner. If you don't do that, you're a sinner. But that's not how these early monastics saw things. 
Instead of being about doing this and not doing that, believing this and not, and not believing that, the whole emphasis for these early Christian teachers was simply on loving God and neighbor as ourselves. On loving God and neighbor as God has already loved us. The God in whose image we are, after all, created. But I'll talk more about those distortions of that image next week. For now, I want to focus on this goal they had of growing in love of God and neighbor that was so important to these early monks. Dorotheus of Gaza, a 6th century monk in Abba, spent a great deal of his time teaching about how when we grow closer to God, we also grow closer to one another. Our loving God correlates directly to how we also love our neighbor. In talking about this, Dorotheus used a wonderful image to illustrate how these two things, the love of God and the love of neighbor, are so intri intricately connected to each other. So if you will, and I should have had a slide for this, but I just I didn't have time to get it done. But, so picture in your mind, if you will, this. this. You take in a compass, you know what a compass is, we all do geometry, right? Or will at some time if you're not old enough to take it yet. But picture a compass. And so you, you insert the point, and then you take that compass and you draw a circle around the point. The center point of that circle is the same distance from any point on the circum circumference, right? Suppose then that that circle represents the world. And the center point is God. So suppose then you also took and drew straight lines from the circumference to that center point. Those straight lines would represent human lives. <coughs> so you have that image? <coughs> so you've got this circle with God in the center and you've got these lines drawn from the circumference to the center. So what happens when you move from the world closer to God, what happens in relation to the other people, those other lines? As you move closer to God, you also move closer to other people. Those two things are connected. And if you can't get that picture of a... Of a, of a, of a compass in your mind in that circle, think of a wagon wheel. I mean, that's a little easier. You have the wagon wheel with the wheel, and then the hub would be God, the wheel's the world, and the spokes are us. And as you move from the outside of the wheel to the inside, you get closer to those other spokes, right? I mean, it's just the way it works. And that's the way it's supposed to be in our love of God and labor. As we move closer, as we grow in our love of God, we should also at the same time be growing in our love and neighbor. And if we are distant or unable to love our neighbor, then it also conversely affects our ability to love God. Those two go together. You can't really love God with also, without also loving your neighbor as well. And for them, loving your neighbor was not about some fancy emotion. It was about caring for your neighbor like so many of you in this room do already. It was about justice. It was about caring for those who can't care for themselves. And I've lost my place. <laughs> well, let's see, where was I? Okay. Anyway, again, I think this is where the Western <coughs> Church kind of got things messed up. They took that simple understanding of loving God and neighbor and, and somehow got us to where we we're all about condemning ourselves for the failures, for moral failings, for other failings in our life. And I don't think God ever intended it to be that way, but that's how we've come to understand sin in the Western part of Christianity. But what we really need to understand is that each one of us is created in the image of God. I read that from Genesis, right? 
And that even though that image may have become distorted in us, guess what? God's love has not. First and foremost, God loves us. And because God loves us, then we are able to also love God and to love our neighbors. Period. That's the basic message. If only we could get that. I mean, I think we get it here, right? But where I've always had trouble over the years and where I think so many of us struggle is getting that idea that God loves us from here to here. That we're not somehow so messed up that God can't really love us. We have trouble understanding that unconditional love that God has for us. How many of you have ever heard someone say, God loves you in spite of who you are? <laughs> Come on, I know you've heard it. I've said it. <laughs> I actually said it in front of Dr. Bondi one time, and boy, was she quick to set me straight. But think about that statement. It's a very common, common sentiment in Christianity. But it's also dead wrong. God doesn't love us in spite of who we are. God loves us as we are. Colin put it so wonderfully in the song we started out with. Roberta put it this way. Her and Richard have been married for 35 years, and both of them were my professors almost 30 years ago. So I've known them a long time, and I've been with them in a lot of different settings. And, and they just love each other. And Richard just dotes on Roberta. I mean, he just almost worships her. He adores her so much. And Roberta put it this way. She said, so picture me arriving home from this retreat. I get back in Atlanta, and I drive to our condo in Decatur, and Richard, Richard greets me at the door, and he's got my favorite dog, Curly, in his arm. And he says, oh, Roberta, it is so good to see you. I have missed you so much. Roberta, I love you in spite of who you are. <laughs> I wouldn't feel very affirming, would it? <coughs> I think it's a similar thing for us as parents. As a parent, would you say to your child, I love you in spite of who you are? You know, I love Hunter as unconditionally as somebody can love someone, or as unconditionally as I can. And he's only five, and so there's not a whole lot of things he's done yet that, you know, make me irritated. But I know as he grows up and becomes more independent, and especially as he becomes a teenager, there are probably going to be things that he does that make me want to pull my hair out, or maybe his. But I can't ever imagine saying to or about Hunter, you know, Hunter, I love you in spite of who you are. No. I love Hunter because Hunter is my child, and I love him. That's just it. No conditions. He may mess up, and he probably will. But I will not love him any less. And I won't love him in spite of who he is. I will love him because of who he is, because he is my son. So if I'm that way, if human parents that way, how much more so for God, who is the perfect heavenly parent? So why do we attribute to God such horrible statements like, I love you in spite of who you are? I just can't imagine God feeling that way. Even though I've said that in the past, now that I seem to finally get it after all these years of hearing it, that's not who God is. Julian of Norwich was a 7th century mystic and also one of Roberta's favorite teachers. And she said that God's love is so strong that God doesn't even bother looking at the things we do wrong. Is that cool? I mean, how cool is that? How freeing is that? God loves us so much that God doesn't even bother looking at the things we do wrong, at the ways we mess up. Roberta also used another example. She said that you, those of you who are in love, remember falling in love? You remember that infatuation that you felt? You know when that other person 
could do no wrong than like, you know, how it probably is now. <laughs> but you know how when you first fall in love with someone and, and you, you can't see their flaws, you can't see their faults, they can do no wrong. I mean, they are the perfect person in the universe. And it's that kind of crazy love. No, don't carry it out too far because, you know, for most of us that goes away a bit. But Roberta says God's love for us is like that infatuation kind of love where we just love crazily. And that God loves us with that crazy love. And God wants to be with us. And God wants to spend time with us. God wants to be our friend. And I think if we can believe, truly believe in our heart of hearts and the center of our being that God loves us like that, that it can really truly transform our lives. And then maybe we can start loving ourselves like that. That's the first place to start. Love your neighbor as yourself implies that you love yourself first. And then once you can love yourself as God loves you, then you can start loving God and others in that same way. Now, it doesn't, it's not something that happens overnight. Okay, I, I believe in Jesus. I'm a Christian now. I'm going to perfectly love. Folks, it doesn't work. I am a work in progress. <laughs> but you know what? I believe it's possible to love that way. I think it's something we can grow into in our journey of faith, in our journey towards God. I think it starts with prayer, like it did with those early monastics, with self-reflection and self-understanding. And I think it also includes a kindness towards ourselves as we reflect. We need to be gentle with ourselves. But we also need to be gentle with other people. You know, it occurs to me that God looks at us with much more kindness than we look at ourselves or we look at others. So my prayer is that you can truly get it, knowing your core being that God loves you not in spite of who you are, but that God loves you with a crazy love that never goes away, that never gives up, for which there are no conditions. And then knowing that you can live out that love to others. Thanks be to God.